Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Hey. This is the Cool Smartphone Podcast Special Edition for the week of October 19th, 2015. I'm Matteo Doni, Chief Pixel Density Enthusiast for CoolSmartphone.com. And with me this evening, I have Kellen from Cool Smartphone. Hi, Kellen. Hey, guys. How you doing? Good, good. Thanks. How are you? Oh, uh, yeah, a crazy week, so I'm glad it's over. Um, so on Monday, we had some insanity. We topped that off with craziness on Tuesday, and we went bat wing crazy th Wednesday and Thursday, so today, something nice and simple. We'll try a video podcast, which, of course, we've done so often. And, uh, yeah, this is us right now. Excellent. So as the description currently says uh, of this episode, we're making it up as we go along. We have no idea what's happening. And this evening, we wanted to get together and talk about networks. Uh, it's something we alluded to uh, in the last podcast with John. Uh, we wanted to talk about networks and clarify a few of the acronyms, terms, and technologies behind something that we in the industry are often comfortable with. But to newcomers may be a bit of a surprise, something a bit of a dark art. So obviously there are lots of acronyms, lots of different things that make our wonderful smartphones work. Where do you think we should start off, Kellen? I think, uh, I guess we could talk about radios and um, in fact, we could go from uh, G's, the different G's. Okay then. Um, I've, I take it you're referring to the generations of mobile networks. So we won't start all the way from Marconi and radio waves, even though that has quite a bearing on what we're going to chat about. But we're talking about what is referred to as 2G or GPRS, 3G or UMTS, uh, 3.5G, uh, which is HSPA, and okay, all the way so up to 4G. What about 3.75G, if you're really going to go there? Yes. And then 3.9G, which is even more stupid. I'll wait till 4.1. But let's start <laughs> off on why we call these different generations. So why do we never talk about first-generation networks? Or does, do people seldom do that? Uh, so some people may remember the days when mobile phones couldn't send text messages when cellular networks were based on a technology called TAX, which was an analog uh, phone call service. And essentially your phone was a giant walkie-talkie that spoke to massive repeaters. And that's in cellular connectivity infancy, thanks to Motorola, that's what was the standard and the base technology that kicked everything off. Obviously this was a very power intensive system. The phones required big, heavy uh, batteries and were often more suited to cars. Uh, Kellen, do you remember those days? I was a young nipper scrapper or whatever they call Whipper scrapper. Ripper snapper. Ripper snapper. Yes. What I remember? I, I do remember my father had an Ericsson which couldn't do text messages but was amazing because it was tiny. How about you? I remember um, watching the phones. I remember watching Greed is Good <laughs> from the original Wall Street, right? That was, you're walking around with a, on the beach with a handset that you could probably get yourself a little bit fit by doing um, some type of sports exercise with. The battery couldn't last more than two hours, I reckon, because battery technology was in its infancy. They were probably using car batteries. And the phones really were the cradles of handsets. That was the, the origin. Yeah, so essentially Gordon Gecko style uh, phones. That was 1G, or the first generation of mobile technology. It was great because it enabled uh, slightly faster, better phone communication, and it was all about calls. Uh, at the end of the day, technologies and comms are all about increasing the frequency, affordability of communication, and this was the first step. So 
as Kellen mentioned, Wall Street, a lot of the people who benefited from the technology and wouldn't spare much expense in getting it were people like traders, uh, emergency services, companies that could outlay large amounts of cash for the benefit of this being able to be connected to people via phone anywhere and everywhere, even out and about or in their cars. So that's essentially first generation, also known as tax. And Motorola was at the forefront of this. Arguably, they invented the standards. Uh, Didn't Ericsson have uh, quite a lot to do with it as well? They did indeed. So Ericsson, a Swedish company, uh, we, we, that we all remember with great fondness, uh, were also involved in it. And that essentially was a technology that was mainstream in mobile telephony until the mid to late 90s, depending on where you lived and what sort of tech you're into. So around about 1996, uh, the second generation of mobile technology, also known as GSM, became widespread, as in the infrastructure was upgraded, the handsets became more affordable. And in a real term, this was when the democratization of mobile t technology happened. So the technology went from analog to digital, and the prices of the handsets, the chips in the handsets, and all the components and the batteries went down and people started being able to afford them. As well as phone calls, devices could handle data streams equivalent to the days of dial-up, so what people had at home. That was extremely expensive, but the novelty was text messages, being able to send a short digital message from phone number to phone number if your phone network supported that. And that's when I came into the world of mobile. Uh, I had my first GSM handset which was an Ericsson, coincidentally. Ericsson, good days. Um, way back when, second generation, I remember having, uh, they used to have this little rubber stub that was their signature um, icon, as well as glass feeling type buttons. Um, and they went, those that, that sort of design language lasted for a very, very long time. They could have been made out of, magnesium for all I know because they could always take a pounding and, and still keep going. Yeah, Ericsson were, as we mentioned, uh, at the forefront of GSM. Motorola struggled slightly to keep up with Ericsson uh, in those days. Uh, they made a big comeback slightly after that, but uh, they maintained their design standards and still kept on supporting TAC well into the periods of GSM until tax networks were deprecated or shut down. Um, and with GSM, uh, we had the advent of Ericsson, Nokia, Siemens, uh, a whole bunch of brands such as Alcatel, which were given an opportunity in a market to move into to create handsets, backed by these digital networks that were being rolled out. So GSM, we can say, is democratization of mobile the second generation. Now that still exists today as a backup uh, for when the newer generations, the internet connectivity uh, networks don't exist or when they don't support voice, you fall back. Kellen's gone silent. No, nope, it turned out you froze for a good little while. So the wonders of miracles of modern technology. Oh dear. But I'm back. Excellent. So sorry, you were about to say something there? So the interesting thing was, although we had this um, GSM, which by the way, originally stood for Group Special Mob Mobile, I'm guessing French. It now stands for Global System for Mobile Telecommunications, which as it sounds is global. Almost. Yes. <laughs> About that. So second generations uh, in the UK, where we are today, uh, is the standard in almost everywhere. Uh, at the same time, in different markets, 
specifically Japan, Korea, and the United States of America, and other parts of the American continent, such as Canada uh, and some Latin American countries, the technology was that was standard for digital cellular connectivity was something called CDMA. So, Kellen, what is CDMA? Thank you for that. Um, so, essentially, there were two competing ways of chopping up your digital signal. Um, one worked by dealing with the amplification and chopping it up that way. Um, and one, de sorry, one dealt with the frequency and one dealt with the amount of time you'd have on any, any given slice. So if you imagine um, the whole point of digitization is you, you get your analog wave, your little sine curve going up and down, up and down, up and down. And then you choose to uh, the middle part would probably be a zero and any of the high parts would be a one. And I think that's how it works. So a high or low part, anything which is noticeable is um, a one and anything which is in the middle range would be a zero. So when digital came along, there were two ways of, of looking at this, at this time frame. Um, one was, so, one was... Uh, so to get this right, so if you imagine your mobile phone signal, which is a radio signal, as a wave going up and down. The peaks are ones, the troughs are zero. Is Pretty much. It? Pretty much. Cool. OK, so yeah, sorry, go, go ahead. So the difference between CDMA and uh, CDMA and GSM was the way that they handled this. Well, Kellen. Has he gone quiet? So it must be a bit of a glitch. Oh, well, never mind. Go ahead. Um, so uh, CDMA, if I remember correctly, is a way of chopping it up by uh, the amount of time any given, any given uh, signal will be allowed to go in the network. So it's digital. You push a whole bunch of signals and people talking at the same time in a base station, and you chopped it up by time. Um, and our version, which for the life of me, I can't remember what it stands for, is TDMA. Yes. Um, chops it up a slightly different way. So it's principles and, and um, a lot of equations more than any fundamental technological difference. Um, however, GSMA uh, was global and uh, CDMA never really took off apart from very few places. And even in Japan, they developed their own version, uh, which wasn't compatible with the American version. And all the American companies developed different versions which weren't compatible with each other. So it was a very interesting time. <laughs> so let's call it network fragmentation, shall we? You, you thought Android was bad. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So with cellular networks, this is the way it worked. And in the second generation, uh, we had, so we had CDMA and GSM. Uh, this wasn't a big issue because at the end of the day, people were still used to mobile phones make, having a primary role as making phone calls. So text messages were nice. They were an extra. They were a bonus. But at the end of the day, the phones were all about voice calls. And that's where the networks made a lot of money. They spent a lot of money in upgrading the networks and rolling them out. And what happened at that point was... 2G was done, everyone said, I'm going to retire on a nice island or in Mexico, retire on a beach and drink margaritas. Others, on the other hand, decided to push it a bit further. They decided this nascent thing called the internet uh, was getting quite big and it was great to be able to send little data bursts to the mobile devices. Who wouldn't want their email on their phone? which was a dream at the time, or being able to fax from the beach. So 3G networks uh, came along. And at the time, this was about 98 to 2000, everyone thought that this internet thing was the bee's knees. And that the governments who owned the spectrum, the radio waves these networks operated on, started doing some pretty impressive stuff to raise a lot of cash on 
some slightly hollow promises. So I'll let you take over from here, Kellen. Tell us what happens. So the launch of 3G, when 3G came along, um, there was the promise of being able to do a lot more with your mobile, with your digital. We weren't entirely sure what you'd be able to do with it, but um, as with most things, people were looking for a what they'd call the killer app, which was the video call at the time. Um, there was a lot of uh, innovation and a lot of networks were doing a lot of trying out a lot of things and a lot of, lots of phones have, were playing with different form factors. However, um, as with all things, the more people that came onto 3G, uh, the slower the network became. And um, there was issues with this video call wouldn't talk to that video call because manufacturers wanted to have their own systems in place. So all of a sudden we had 3G um, issues. And even though, even then video calling didn't take up. One of the reasons is the nature of 3G, it, although it's not just putting more power through the same radio networks, it, it did work in a slightly different way. Uh, one of the benefits is you were able to get triangulation and location things going on. Uh, one of the drawbacks of that is for triangulation, you need at least two masts. Um, so you wouldn't get out of signal and three masts work better, but the radio power started draining the battery even more. So if you can imagine, we wanted more. We wanted the bigger screens, drains the battery, we now know them. We wanted the color, it drains the battery, we now, now know that. We want to do video calling, which is a lot more data, a lot more bandwidth, a lot more than just the really efficient voice codex drains the battery, we now know that. So all of a sudden we've gone from phones which could last for ages and ages and ages, back and into tiny. And with small and then big and then small, um, to really big phones which didn't last as long as the tiny battery, tiny phones of the Nokia 8210s of the world. It's a little bit amusing because now we're on 4G, the same thing is happening again. We're getting this great big <laughs> huge tablets and the battery doesn't last and we're complaining about talk time. However, along with the one killer app which didn't come, came a lot of different apps. The ubiquity of the internet means uh, doing stuff on your mobile more than just talking and texting became a real possibility. It turned out there wasn't any killer app. The killer app was the ability to do everything else. So the internet. The internet. I still remember, even before the days of 3G, Cat pictures were a thing on phones, on grayscale screens. So they knew it was coming. They, the technology just wasn't ready. I don't know how uh, Nokia managed it and Ericsson managed it, but you could get emoji even back then. Yes, there were there were grayscale picture uh, messages uh, sent in numeric encoding. They were they were beautiful. You know what I miss about two G. And the keypad, if you, um, back in the day, you would never have a contact address book full of hundreds and hundreds of numbers. You'd only have uh, at maximum maybe 50 people. Uh, some of the phones allowed you to assign a, a number to them. So you could literally go number 35. And if you knew who number 35 was, that's the, you had the shortcut in being able to call them. I've just realized that now for all the benefits we've got. And, trying to say okay google okay google okay google okay siri okay siri okay Kotana. just dialing three five call was even quicker yes let's not forget these were the days when uh you could save your whole phone book to your sim card and when you got a new phone you could take the sim card out of your phone not a memory card the actual sim card that allows you to connect to the network put it into a new phone and there you had your whole phone book was synced from one phone to the other and I remember this in, uh, I was living in Italy at the time, the arms race, the marketing race between the phone networks, at the time it was uh, Telecom Italia and with Tim and Omnitel, which later was acquired by Vodafone. Um, they were in an arms race about how big the storage in the SIM card was. So you had, oh, this is just a 32K SIM card as opposed to the other network who's offering me 64, 
But that network over there is really expensive because you get 128k SIM card. And that's the way it was. There was no such thing as uh, micro SD cards or memory cards for phones unless you had a portable computer. So that was a while back. And the main thing was a name, which is limited in characters, and a phone number. That, that was it. And, and then with 3G, 3G, the whole thing about memory and storage came along and what you were doing. Oh dear, really bad roboting I'm hearing. Is that roboting? Okay, you seem to be back now. Androiding? Android indeed. But it's back. <laughs> Good. So yes, those days of 2G were when you had your phone book and your thing. But then 3G came along. Uh, let's not forget the governments around the world had a big hand in maybe delaying the technology slightly because they auctioned off the spectrum, so the radio waves that could be used for the 3G networks at insanely high prices. And the networks believed this video calling thing was a thing and paid for them. But it never really paid off in the short term everyone was expecting it to. It was something that took a lot longer than expected. And a lot of investments uh, went either south or had to extend their investment uh, horizon and took a lot longer to pay back. So it was an interesting time. Uh, a few companies and networks came and went in during that time. A lot of rebranding and takeovers. Uh, I mentioned earlier Vodafone and Omnitel. That was in Italy. In the UK, we had networks like One to One, which was then acquired by T-Mobile. Uh, do you remember those days, Kellen? The, the, before one to one, it was something else. Hutchinson, Hutchinson, one to one. Was it Hutchinson, Hutchinson something? Yeah, and then it became uh, one to one, and then it became T-Mobile. Right. Okay. I I I went back. I mean, I had one of the before the there were three tariffs once upon a time. There's a bronze, silver, and gold, and before that, I think there was a personal tariff and a, a business tariff, and before that, oh, they were good days. However. <laughs> Um, just to go back to now, where we are, third generation, one of the most interesting things about this auction and the amount of money that um, the operators uh, were expecting to be able to make is they spent £22.5 billion pounds on license, on radio, on this stuff that we can't see. We, can't, we, we, we can never prove it's there, although we use it. £22.5 billion. Um, I don't care which company you are, you're going to need to make some type of return on investment. So you started to see um, multiple tariffs come in. You started to see them trying to make money back however they could, which meant that this ubiquitous data, the dream of ubiquitous data, they had to charge for it because it was, <laughs> it was expensive. It's a far cry from today, but 22 and a half billion is quite a lot of money. It was indeed. Uh, even with, with inflation factored in, that's still a lot of money. Uh, so yeah, 3G came along. Uh, it was very slow in its uptake. It was relatively expensive for consumers. Again, it was tended to be businesses that had critical need of the internet that invested in the consumer side of it as a business. Uh, but the networks, apart from a few of them, took their time and it took a while. And data rates for consumers were extremely high, even on 3G networks. And right at the beginning, uh, if I remember that you didn't have data on your phone, what you had was uh, the ability to use it as a modem somehow. So you'd have uh, cards, these little cards which fitted into the old wider slots you'd have in your laptop. They're dead nowadays, but uh, I think they were called Express Card. Express Card 54? P PCIe laptop PCM cards? PCMCIA cards, yes. PCMCIA cards were first, and then PCIe cards. And slowly but slowly, um, it got to the level where, as technology matured, laptops got smaller. You could plug it into a, to your USB slot, and even that disappeared. And we have MiFi units, which are essentially Wi-Fi on a stick. Yes, so 
3G brought around this whole mobile computing and internet on the go. It took almost a decade for it to become, for, for the, I'd say, the majority of the consumer market to become comfortable with it. And just as that was happening, in 2007, a company well known for its fruity logo launched a phone which kick-started the 3G, uh, 3G smartphone revolution for consumers despite not having a 3G radio. So that was Apple in 2007. Steve Jobs went on stage and demonstrated a smartphone which didn't have a keyboard, which was very confusing to everyone at the time. But it was a 2G device. It took them till their second generation phone to have 3G, ironically. Uh, but at the time, in 2007, it was commonplace to have a BlackBerry. Not necessarily a 3G one, but a BlackBerry with a keyboard that specialized in text email. Or a smartphone based on Windows Mobile or on Palms OS with the Trios. Those were the days. Trios and Pixies and Palm Prees and whatnot. However, if I remember correctly, the Trios um, were still Windows Mobile for a good long time. And then they split and you had the ability to have um, a, a one of the Palm devices with either Windows or their own Palm OS. Yes, um, but either or, uh, they, were, they were clunky, extremely functional, but limited and it took a, quite a learning curve to use them. Uh, I, I remember actually being first in China and then in California during the summer of 2007 with a device which was a Nokia E61. It was marvelous, it was 3G, which means it handled UMTS. I could use it in China, I could use it in the US, as well as the UK. It didn't even have a camera on the back of it. It had a nice big QWERTY keyboard, nice landscape uh, screen, which I believe was a 240 by 320 resolution screen. And the battery lasted me about three days. <laughs> and yes, that was 3G pre-iPhone. And what happened next, Kellen? Um, so I think we're moving on to 3.5G, um, which is only of relevance to people who like geeking out and listen, would listen to uh, podcasts about network connectivity. Uh, we all wanted the promise of better 3G. There was a limit to how fast this 3G could go. And I think if I remember correctly, it was 394 kilobits on the original 3G. So though there was faster, it really didn't match the sort of speeds we're seeing these days. 3.5G came along. Uh, first of all, it was called HSDPA. And it worked a bit like broadband. In fact, it still does. With most broadband, you get faster download speeds than you get upload speeds. So high speed download packet access. Uh, some, at some point, they uh, contracted it because what they realized is that people wanted their stuff to come to them. So the download part was uh, uh, important. Uh, we, now we've contracted it, the, uh, the terminology to these days, to just explain that it's the access we want. So high speed packet access, HSPA. Yes. And so I believe there were some networks that were selling themselves as HS UPA. Am I correct? For connections or networks that were providing a faster upload speed. Correct. So, yes, that was essentially abbreviated to HSPA and then HSPA plus. Is, was that the 3.75G you were referring to? Absolutely. And I think um, by that time we were seeing speeds or uh, potential speeds of something like 33 megabytes download uh, quite easily. So that's we're talking faster than most residential internet connections in the UK. That's thirty. Still. still, it still is today. True, but then again, uh, with the frequencies uh, these networks were working on, this uh, 
was a problem because potentially, unless you're standing right underneath a cell tower, you weren't going to get these uh, speeds. And that's something we can discuss now. It's important to remember that all the different carriers or networks operate on different uh, different frequencies. So when we talk about frequencies, there are chunks of frequency that go in megahertz from, say, 800 to 900 or 900 to 1 gigahertz or 1,000 megahertz. And that's what the essentially the frequencies the cell towers repeat on and your phone connects to. Is that right, Kellen? It is indeed. I think I'd um, better explain uh, just a little bit. When networks first started, we were only had pretty much one frequency allowed, and that was the 900 megahertz spectrum. With the advent of uh, 2G, which was the advent of digital, uh, and with the one, one uh, analog, there were two uh, main competitors. There was BT Cellnet and Vodafone Raycall. Voda Raycall, if I remember. BT Cellnet eventually turned into uh, BT. No, Cellnet, sorry. Voda Raycall turned into Vodafone. And then came along 2G, and the government wanted more competitors. They wanted more money for Spectrum, and they wanted uh, variety. So we had two more entrants come in the game. Uh, and then came Hutchinson, who created a brand new company uh, called Orange. Or were they one to one? No, or well, Orange was the French telecoms provider, wasn't it? Yes. The yes. future is bright, yeah. the future is orange, was their slogan. And after, um, with them came one-to-one, -one as the other two. Now, because uh, Vodafone and uh, BT Cellnet, right, which would later be, would later be turned into O2, which is what I'm going to refer to them so I don't mess up, uh, there were now four competitors. Two had the 900 megahertz signal, the original analog, which they used for digital and analog because they had older customers. And two had the digital uh, signal, which would be 1800 megahertz. Uh, as you may imagine, having different frequencies means uh, you get different types of signal entering different buildings and having different properties. Yeah. When, uh, this becomes important, not immediately, um, but when you start to need to get a call in uh, in, in the city or in building penetration, some frequencies are better than others. So does that go by the bigger the number, the more difficult it is to get into buildings? Or the lower the number, it easier, it, the easier it is for it to happen? I almost always get this wrong. The lower the number, the easier it is to get into buildings. Yes, I well done, was... you hit the jackpot. <laughs> I was told this analogy. Do you remember um, when you are on a block party and uh, uh, somebody else is having a party down the block and you can hear it from, you can only hear the bass part, the boom, 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 boom. Those are the lower frequencies that are able to travel and you hardly ever hear the higher frequencies. The trade-off is the higher frequencies, you can pack more information in there because of the, the frequency of it. So you can have more data, you can have more users um, doing more things on the higher frequencies. Right, okay. Um, I'm afraid I don't remember your analogy there because I was usually the one with the party making lots of noise, but we can go on from there. Hmm, this is going Good. quiet. Good days indeed. Yes, those are those were the days. But yes, that's a very good analogy. So it's similar to sounds. There's more happening in the front higher frequencies, more users, but the lower frequencies were more suited to say rural areas or getting into big old heavy stone buildings, uh, which are quite common here in the UK. They could travel further. 
So let's start off with 4G. So 3G, 3.5G, 3.7G all worked on the same frequencies. The technology was an improvement and an iteration on 2G, but it was still a digital signal. And then the whole talk of 4G came along. And 4G was something that places like the US had been experimenting with for, for with a while in their markets. There are very different fundamental technologies such as WiMAX and LTE. And some people are just rebranding what we would just describe as 3.5G or 3.75G as 4G even though it wasn't really 4G because it was a 3.5G technology. However, the reason, the biggest reason, as you said before, was branding, marketing. Every time they introduced a new technology to, in order to be a step ahead of their competitors, one of them said, well, we know 4G is coming. You pretty much have the same speeds as you will when you have this alleged true 4G. Um, so we'll call whatever we have now 4G. That actually turned out to be uh, what we call 3.9G. Right. Yes, that was the, the whole clever marketing thing. But the real geeks among us really gave some of the networks a bit of a hard time, even when they drafted the idea of using that terminology here in the UK. And we come to a few years ago when there was the 4G uh, first auction of spectrum and agreements on who could and who couldn't run 4G and 4G in the UK. So 4G in the UK runs on some of the same frequencies as uh, 2G and 3G did. But there's a key addition to that, uh, which required another big infrastructure change in the country. Uh, this isn't something that just happened in the UK, but we're talking about it because it's probably someone, some, something a lot of people here remember. Uh, when they switched off digital television, the whole reasoning behind that, switching off analog television and switching to digital, was to free up the 800 megahertz spectrum, specifically for the 4G networks. Tell us more, Kellen. Huh. So there was an expectation that this new set of frequencies, this 800, um, would solve a lot of problems uh, in terms of giving users more speed. Because although we went from 3G to 3.9G, there wasn't a lot of what we'd call a substantial difference because our smartphones used more and more data. Like anything, the more you like it the more you use it and there's only so much of anything to go around so you still have congestion in large cities just like cars 800 megahertz you'll have uh, notice is just a little bit lower than 900 megahertz so there are two different groups competing groups there there's one set of groups who have the 900 megahertz who think well i can have some eight but it's not significantly different and there's another group which would be those who have the 1800 and the 2100, which would be uh, three, who would quite like different types of frequency because it would complement their own. Right. By this time, uh, you most of the networks, because they'd be uh, EE had amalgamated with, or had been the amalgamation of Orange and T-Mobile, because uh, Vodafone and O2 have been around from first generation, second generation, and third generation. There's a lot of different frequencies running up and down everywhere. So nobody had a pure anything. Nobody ran on one frequency. This 800 complemented pretty much everybody. The government also decided to sell off 2,600 uh, megahertz which as if you've been listening earlier when Matteo explained, the 2600 is the stuff that probably won't go in buildings. So it did make a lot of people ask, well, why would you want this 2600? Matteo, would you like to explain why 2600 was a good idea? 2600 was a good idea because uh, essentially you can have on, for on one mast, you can have a very, very high concentration of users and the speeds all those user has have is much much higher 
Now, because of the high, high frequency of those signals, it's very tough to get that through buildings. But if you think of scenarios such as a few hundred thousand people at, say, an open air event, such as a stadium and events around that, think of potentially Edinburgh New Year or the New Year in, around the Thames in London. Very high population of people all making video calls, Instagramming, sending their tweets. At the same time, the, net, the one mast will be able to handle more or less the equivalent of four to eight masts of standard 3G technology. So that's one of the good things about the 2600 megahertz technology. That also opens up the door for future developments with what we now refer to as 5G. Uh, smartphones have really changed the market and how we use our phones, how we connect to the internet. Some people in the younger generations tend to not use the internet as home as much. They're doing everything on mobile. But yes, the, the frequency thing is an important one to understand when you look at numbers when maybe buying a phone and importing it from another country, such as on AliExpress, which frequencies you need to use your network. But within those frequencies, there's also something they call bands. So which area within that frequency chunk is used by each network? Am I right, Callum? You are indeed. Um, I have to admit to not knowing off the top of my head uh, any of the bands, uh, the LTE bands, mainly because I am not a frequent traveler around the world. True, but it's not just for, for, for travelers. So essentially networks uh, have a share of each chunk of frequency. So say the 1,800 megahertz range, they will have bands within that which they share amongst the different networks. So in the same area, I may have, say, EE and 3 on the 1,800 megahertz uh, spectrum with their 4G LTE technology. And within that, they have different bands. And the same goes for Vodafone and O2. And the idea is, if you're buying a phone from China on AliExpress, check which bands that phone supports. If it's a phone originally made for the Chinese market, it will only support certain bands within the frequencies, which means you'll only be able to use that phone on E or 3. The LTE uh, bands that O2 and Vodafone use won't work. And I think we should make that clear when reviewing devices on coolsmartphone.com. Often, some devices, you'll only be able to get the most out of them, use them with the 4G LTE speeds if you're on EE or 3. It'll work fine on 3G with all the other networks, but you might be missing out on some of the fun. Do you agree, Kellen? Absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the things that um, when the iPhone, to use a famous example, when it first launched, it only had uh, availability for one operator in the UK, which is not surprising because its original market was America. When it started expanding, it only added the uh, modems to support the bands that, that it was going towards in the other countries. Right, so that explains Apple's iPhone exclusivity you know, on AT&T in the US and O2 in the UK for the first few years. Exactly. Um, with most phone manufacturers for a very, very long time, they had to do, there, was only so, there were only so many bands that any given radio, the radio inside the phone, could handle. So you had to choose which markets that particular version of a phone was going to support. If you remember, again, in America, each network had very particular and specific uh, radios, and therefore they could only deal with so uh, very specific handsets. Cool. Over in the UK and in Europe, it was slightly different. With, um, hence, a manufacturer could create a phone uh, as long as it worked and so it was guaranteed to work on your GSM frequencies. It would pretty much go European wide. 
there are some slight differences when it came to 4G because some countries rolled out certain amounts of spectrum. Unfortunately, uh, that homogeneousness that we saw previous, uh, not too long ago for 3G and for 2G has split and we're now back to fragmentation of networks. <laughs> this has got to be the new podcast name for the fragmentation episode. Yeah. Yeah, Where, that's a good, was, good idea. Fragmentation, <laughs> fragmentation, fragmentation. Yeah, so that's, uh, I think that's not to 4 g 5G, just to pull it back and get a little tiny bit geeky, um, was going to be what we would have called uh, the fourth generation, if I remember correctly. In between HSUPA, um, there was LTE. And LTE got a lot of things smarter. It got latency down, which is really important. But uh, there was another uh, generation, which we haven't actually gotten to, which was called LTE Advanced. Yes, that will be probably referred to as 4.5G um, once everyone agrees on the marketing terminology. Am I right? <laughs> We're already talking. If you have a look, um, you see a lot of uh, news articles. Um, Sorry, sort of laboratories. So you've just gone roboty uh, of the USB variety. You might need to unplug and plug in again. Let me know when I'm back. You're back, and you're not roboty in the USB type. That's always good news. Good, good. So, sorry, you're saying LT advanced. Yeah, so uh, this was an interesting proposition. Uh, or it will be an interesting proposition. Although that's the technical terminology, we're talking about a bunch of standards and technology that hasn't, doesn't actually exist at the moment. So anybody who talks about 5G and the, the promises it can bring, there are no standards defined. We're still working it out as we go along. So essentially we're in, back in the same situation we were with 4G and what happened in the US with WiMAX and LTE. Uh, WiMAX was essentially a, an implementation of Wi-Fi, essentially like Wi-Fi, but on a bigger scale. Uh, and LTE was a slightly more expensive and complicated setup that was slightly more reliable. So we're back in that situation. Uh, what's likely to happen is that as far as 5G is concerned, the people who make the masts and the technologies behind that and the networks will fight it out in a free market uh, like the US. They will agree on a standard and then it will be rolled out to the rest of the world. So we're going to sit back, relax, watch and see what happens, learn from others' mistakes, and then go through with it. If only it were that easy. <laughs> oh, no. Um, we're not sure. One of the things that happened uh, for Britain, at the very least, is that the 3G frequencies the, uh, that EE was using, they were allowed to effectively jump start working on using it for 4G. Oh, good. So essentially repurpose what they already had and turn it into 4G. It's just the frequencies, not the technology. The frequencies are not the technology. So we may have multiple frequencies, multiple different technologies. We have, may have multiple uh, types of, of, of radio networks combining to make uh, mobile better. So for instance, we have uh, Wi-Fi calling, which you can use your computer to dial. You can, you, you, you've got your, um, every network now has a, a Wi-Fi calling app. That they're, um, they're also working on extending that. So you can use your phone to, to now make a phone call. So your watch to make a phone call. Um, you can use your, your computer to connect to your phone to make calls. So the nature of calls and what it means is now changing so dramatically. By the time 5G comes along, I'm not even sure we're going to recognize it. We'll all be recording podcasts on Hangouts on, on air by then. Am I right? Oh, naturally, because it works so well. It does. It's a wonderful tool. Thank you, Google. 
Hangouts on Air is a wonderful thing. This is our experiment episode of Hangouts on Air uh, recording the Cool Smartphone podcast. If you've just stumbled across this video on YouTube, don't worry. You can read more about it on coolsmartphone.com. Coolsmartphone.com. Cool Smartphone is where you can read the works of Lee Geary, Kellen, who is here on the show with me today, and my own writings. Kellen is our senior editor. I am the chief pixel density enthusiast, and we have a wonderful stable of writers um, who, how shall we put it, engage in rampant opinionism about smartphones and technology and break some pretty interesting news. I, we're not a newspaper. We may deliver facts, but the reason we do this is for the love of it. And if that doesn't show through by now, then you have been listening to something else and reading somebody else. We do this because we love what we do. Essentially, we're geeks at heart. Not only do we use the technology we're interested in, more or less how it works, and love playing with new gadgets. I think you're damn right there, although it's been a long while since I've been to, had, having a new gadget. And I don't want to start on my Nexus obsession, so let's not go there today. <laughs> okay, we'll wait till November 3rd till 5th when the final batch of Nexus devices reaches consumer hands. That's these hands if you're watching the YouTube video. I'm waiting for my Nexus 6P to arrive on that day. How about you, Kellen? Have you ordered something or are you resisting this year? I will be ordering something. Um, I still don't know, and it sounds ridiculous, right? But I still don't know whether that WQHD screen plus three and a half amp hours is going to last longer than 2,700 uh, milliamp hours and a FHD screen. Until I can work it out, I, I'm not going to... It's all about the battery. They're, they're very, very much of a muchness for me. Okay. Well, as chief pixel density enthusiast of coolsmartphone.com, I use a Google Nexus 6 as my daily diet driver, specifically for the AMOLED WQHD screen and the fact that there's an, an almost supply of tasteful mocodile pleather and real leather backs for it on AliExpress.com. And so I ordered the Nexus 6P. It increases the pixel density whilst keeping the resolution the same. What more could I desire? For a chief pixel density enthusiast, I cannot think of anything. Oh, there is one thing. I should barely mention it, but um, you do know about the Sony Z5 Premium. I've heard of that. Tell me more. Um, I would love to get into it. But I think we should leave the net, this alone, that alone for um, our standard episodes. Oh, that uh, sounds like a great idea. Um, yes, we'll wait. Uh, our uh, resident expert on Sony is Gary, who will be on the next episode of the Cool Smartphone podcast. Uh, but I think that's everything here. Uh, feel free to add questions, uh, rants, and compliments into the comments section. I think that's everything from us. So that's everything from cool chief pixel density enthusiast at coolsmartphone.com. And Kellen? Uh, that's everything for me. Kellen, who's the right editor of the day? Excellent. And what, how can people follow you online, apart from reading your excellent articles on coolsmartphone.com? Um, you can reach me uh, on uh, Kellen at coolsmartphone.com. Uh, you can reach me on Google+. Plus. You can reach me on Twitter using uh, WeBanger5. In fact, if you just uh, search for me on WeBanger5, you can pretty much hit me up anywhere. Excellent. And I'm Matteo Doni on Google+, Plus and Todoleo on Twitter. Uh, just do a search for Matteo Doni. And if you don't see articles from coolsmartphone.com, you're likely to find articles on my personal blog, matteodoni.com. So thanks very much for tuning in, everyone. Uh, we hope we haven't made you feel ill with all our opinionistic rant about networks and the history of the various Gs. 
And over, do you want to wrap this up, Kellen, or shall I? Um, I think I think we should uh, just say goodbye in one very amazing, inimitable, and in tribute to somebody who we used to read in a very long time ago, Paul. Yes, Paul. Paul. Thank you, Paul. Paul. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.